another lightning talk coming up here. We have got Hamza on deck. Hamza has been creating all kinds of AI applications for the last 20 years, and I'm so excited to learn from you. You're currently at Google. We talked about what this talk was going to be about. I know you got 10 minutes, so I want to be very, very conscientious of time. I'm going to be the timekeeper, and as I've been saying, the, the whole talk or the whole conference that I'm the shaman guiding us through the journey. So I'm going to hand it over to you, Hamza, and let you get cracking, and I'll be back in 10 minutes. Perfect. Thank you so much. Can you just confirm that you can see my screen? I can. Yes, we see Perfect. it. Awesome. Clearly. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me today. Um, and I'm really thrilled that we have such a big audience today. My name, everyone, is Hamsa Bovaragan. I lead AI solutions at Google Cloud. And being in the cusp of innovation and emerging technologies, I'm really humbled to share some of my observations around implementing LLMs today. So LLMs and generative AI, we all know, has the potential to revolutionize so many industries and aspects of our lives. When I was asked to come and speak about the LLM use cases, I wanted to step back a little bit. I think when generative AI is taking off at full speed, we need to first of all have an understanding of the use cases, but we need to also look at the use cases that drive the most value for your industry. And I was referring to this McKinsey report on the economic potential of generative AI, and it really provides a really good framework for assessing your own industry. So if you look here, it shows you how you can highlight uh, some of the use cases that drive the highest potential value. And in this case, it's showing banking, life sciences, retail, and consumer packaged industries. Our teams have been working with so many different customers around LLM use cases. Most of you are familiar with these use cases. It's really common nowadays from document summarization to content discovery. We've already seen so many benefits. I work very closely with media companies on unique content discovery experiences. I also work with retailers on product catalog enhancements. I work with, again, uh, um, marketing companies on multi-channel marketing and healthcare companies on healthcare uh, research and information discovery. And for all you de developers out there, there are so many different developer tools now and um, uh, built on top of LLMs that can help you improve your developer productivity. Now, before I go uh, more deeper in, I wanted to talk a little bit about the LLM application stack. And I was thinking of how best to bring in a diagram all the moving parts that, in, uh, that is involved in an LLM's app stack. And I came across an article uh, from Anderson Horowitz, and I wanted to walk you through the stack using this depiction. At a very high level, the workflow is divided into three stages. So the data pre-processing and embedding, the prompt construction and retrieval, and the prompt execution and inference. So in the data pre-processing embedding, this stage involves storing the data to be retrieved later. So this can be any of the uh, private data that you have in your organization. And typically the documents are broken into chunks. And so they are passed through an embedding model and then stored in a specialized database called a vector database. During the prompt construction and retrieval phase, when a user submits a query, the application constructs a series of prompts to submit to the language model. And a compiled prompt typically combines a prompt template hard-coded by the developer and examples of valid outputs called few shot examples, any necessary information that's retrieved from external APIs, for example, and a set of relevant documents that you're retrieving from your own vector database. And then you have the prompt execution or the inference. And so once the prompts have been combined, compiled, they are submitted to a pre-trained LLM for inference. And this includes both proprietary model APIs and open source or self-trained models. Some developers can add operational systems like logging, caching, and validation at this stage. So the reason I wanted to kind of share all the things that is done in an LLM application stack, so there's a lot going on, and it's really great, right? Super exciting. But, but I just definitely want to point out that although this is all exciting, the LLMs are really far from perfect. And many of you know, we've all played with it for the last couple of months, and it's not really, really perfect. So while they are powerful and versatile, they come with a lot of pitfalls. So the users, uh, I mean, as users, you need to be aware of this. So there's issues with accurately citing sources, there's inherent biases, 
uh, is generating false information, uh, there's difficulties with math, uh, susceptibility to prompt hacking. They're all challenges that need to be addressed. And by understanding these limitations, you can use your LLMs more effectively and responsibly and work towards improving these models. And of course, the cost of training and serving these models, we know it's really huge. Uh, from what I've heard, uh, training a large language model such as GPT-3 could cost over $4 million. Now, among all these risks and pitfalls, the one thing that I want to dive in a little bit is mainly the part of making sure that whatever is generated is credible. So how do we ground our LLMs? How can we unlock the power of real world LLM use cases, but also make sure we can ground them and deliver accurate results? Now, the one thing that most people have to think about is when you want to deliver accurate results, you're looking at some source of data, right? Or some source of knowledge that you're referring to. And where is this knowledge? This knowledge is very much in our own boring databases. And that is actually our source of truth. So if you look at it, most organizations don't realize that now with all this cool stuff, like where is the data getting access from, right? So databases provide the most up-to-date data and can efficiently, now with vector databases, they can efficiently store and search, like you can use them to store and search vector embeddings. They are your trusted familiar data store. So essentially, databases with vector support bridge the gap between LLMs and enterprise gen AI apps. So first of all, the database can, uh, can provide you the most up-to-date data for augmenting your LLM prompts. So this will help you increase your accuracy and relevance. So you can combine the data from your production databases with the power of LLMs, and the uh, generative AI applications now can create more accurate answers than before. Second, most of the data that we see right nowadays is like conversational and it's unstructured. So semantic query is really a key feature that ensures that the right data is retrieved. And vector embeddings can encode the semantic meaning in unstructured data like product descriptions, help desk tickets, and conversation history. And lastly, the best part is that your databases use your trusted source, and you're already it's already supporting like all the part of the business critical uh, things that you need on reliability, data protection, performance, all of that. So developers are already familiar, so you don't have to worry about now figuring out a yet new system for you to understand. The other technique that has become really, really common is RAG. So RAG is nothing but a retrieval augmented generation. This is a technique, and this was this came out first um, in a research paper that was uh, published by Meta. It's used for improving the quality of your LLM generated responses. So now what you're doing basically, you're grounding your model on external sources of knowledge so that you can supplement this. Um, supplement the LLM's internal representation. So what you can do with RAG is RAG can be fine-tuned on knowledge-intensive downstream tasks. So you can achieve the state-of-art results compared with even the largest trained sequence-to-sequence -sequence language models. And unlike these pre-trained models, RAG's internal knowledge can be easily altered or you can even supplement this on the fly. So this way, researchers and engineers such as yourself can control what RAG knows and doesn't know without wasting time or compute power, retraining the entire model. And RAG is more accurate at QA than purely extractive models. And you might think this is somewhat surprising because you're extracting snippets from existing reference and you're thinking like, how is this accurate? So now the way you wanna think about this is uh, the two sources, the parametric and non-parametric memory complement each other. And what the uh, research paper found was RAG uses its non-parametric memory to cue the sequence-to-sequence -sequence model into generating correct responses. So essentially combining the flexibility of the closed book or parametric only approach with the performance of open book or the retrieval based method. Now the performance improves when RAG has access to documents that contains cues to the correct answer, but where the answer is never stated verbatim. And RAG even generates correct answers in certain situations where the correct answer is nowhere to be found in any of the retrieved documents. And that's pretty cool. Now, if you don't, if you want to take away one thing from RAG is a simple two boxes that I'm going to show you. So the approach is as simple as you augment the prompt sent to LLM with relevant data retrieved from an external knowledge base through what is called an information retrieval mechanism. The prompt is designed to use the relevant data as context 
along with the question, and it avoids and minimizes using the parametric memory. So now if you look at it, the external knowledge base that you're seeing is, is your non-parametric memory. And so this approach is essentially RAG, and it's really great for generative QA. And it's not just for generative QA. This is just an example I'm, sh I'm, I'm showing you. Now, this is a depiction of how we have done internally. We built out a QA system based on RAC pattern and some of our products and services around our flagship Vertex AI that responds to questions based on a private collection of documents and adds references to the relevant documents. There's one thing that you want to keep in mind is semantic search is very much part of RAC. And semantic search goes beyond our typical keyword search because it determines the meaning of the questions and source documents and uses that meaning to retrieve more accurate results. And so semantic search is very much part of RAG. So guys, like we are part of a revolution right now, and in fact, very much the start of a revolution. There is so much going on, and my guidance is to just keep up to date on our upcoming research and tools, which is what we are doing ourselves here, although we are innovating so much and incorporating some of these techniques in our LLM use cases, and most importantly, staying grounded. So thank you, everyone. Excellent, Amza. Thank you so much for this talk. It's so cool to have you here. And I love the work that you're doing. Some people do not know this, but you've got a book coming out pretty soon. So can we talk to people about what that is real fast? Oh my God, that's a shameless plug. Yes, uh, I'm writing an anthology on persuasive leadership and I'm talking about some of the challenges in technology leadership, especially for women. Mm. And I'm really, really excited. Uh, the book is coming uh, probably in the next two weeks. So stay tuned. Well, Thanks I know, a lot for that. Yeah, that I, I'm excited for it and I look forward to getting my hands on it. And I know that it's really a lot to ask of you to do this conference while you're finishing off the final touches of the book. So I appreciate you coming on here so much and doing it. And thank you. Thank you.